Hi, I'm Dr. Selena Matthews, spiritual psychologist, and I want to welcome you all to Soul Transformation. My guest today is Dr. Connie Swig. She's an internationally renowned depth psychologist and author of many, many, many books. Today, we're going to focus on her award-winning book, The Inner Work of Age. Our topic today is aging, the transformation from role to soul. This discussion will illuminate the aging process from a myriad of psychological and cultural perspectives. It is going to be an absolutely fascinating show, so I want you to please stay tuned. Dr. Connie, I am so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your amazing book. Um, I am thrilled. Um, I want to start by asking you a question. You know, aging is the fate of human existence. We can either honor it or we can deny it. In your book, you discuss the spiritual journey of aging. So can you extrapolate what that means and what is spiritual aging? Well, that's a beautiful question. I'm so happy to see you, Selena. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, so there are so many books, hundreds, maybe thousands of books about aging. And they all tend to be aging from the outside in, aging in place with housing issues or health care issues or demographic issues of how many people are old, over 65, right? Or Medicare and Social Security issues, financial issues, and so on. I wanted to write about the depth psychology of age, aging from the inside out. And the more that I really kind of steeped in the research, the more I began to see that all of the mystical perennial traditions teach a very simple thing, that the purpose of late life is to explore spirituality and to expand our consciousness and to become what these days we call awake, to become spiritually awake. So this is not a new idea. This is rooted in all of the tr sacred traditions. But what I wanted to do was um, root it in psychology. Because today we have so much precious wisdom from Carl Jung and Freud and depth psychologists. And we have all this precious wisdom from the mystical traditions that have been democratized. I mean, you can learn a practice now that used to be secret and esoteric. And there are not a lot of bridges between those two arenas. So I really wanted to look at what's the psychology and spirituality of aging and how can we use the circumstances of our aging as spiritual practice? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you meditate. I know you've been a meditator for decades, and you've been spiritually aligned for decades. How has that helped you? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky question because I don't knew, know who I would be if I hadn't started meditating at age 19. And now I have 74 years of life experience. So my whole adult life, I've been practicing. So I don't know. I have some ideas about it, but I might be, but um, I, there's no way to really to know. So it's helped me in many ways. Um, I learned at a young age how to quiet my mind and watch my thoughts and watch my feelings. And when you learn how to watch or you learn how to observe yourself or you learn how to witness, what happens is you're not so flooded by your thoughts and feelings. You're not so overwhelmed by them. And I'm not saying that never happens. 
Sometimes I'm really stressed out just like everybody else. But I often have the capacity to observe my own reactivity. Even when I'm hurt or angry, I can observe it. And that gives me a little space from my mind and from my feelings to have some choice about how I react. So that's one of the ways. The other way, I think, is that it oriented me with purpose and meaning from a very young age. So I stopped asking sort of the why questions, the existential questions, because I, I knew that human, the human lifespan was about evolution. It was about becoming aware and awake. And that was kind of baked in for me. And so my books on the shadow are about particular aspects of awakening to our shadows, to the parts of us that cause self-sabotage or that harm others. And then the novel about Rumi's life, The Sufi Poet, is all about his spiritual awakening. And then The Inner Work of Age is all about shifting our identity from role to soul. It's about moving into spiritual life as we age. And then I have a new book out next month called Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, which is more directly about how we meet shadow material in our spiritual lives with our teachers and communities. So that thread of spirituality has kind of followed me through the life and through the career. It's just kind of um, threaded in. I mean, that's really amazing. Since I've gotten to know you, you know, through the Miss Salon, I've watched you write so many books. I'm like <laughs> blown away at your intellect and your ability to write these bo books as quickly as you do. I'm, I'm in amazement, total amazement at what you're capable of doing. My goodness, it's amazing. Well, you know, Selena, I don't experience it that way. Um, and again, this is, I think, in response to meditation. Um, because what I learned a few decades ago is that if I do a lot of research and then I meditate, the writing just comes. So I, I, I read, I interview, I talk to people, and then I empty my mind, and then the, the books come through. So it's not an effort, it's not effortful, and it, and it almost doesn't even feel like it's from my mind. It doesn't feel like it's an intellectual process or an analytical process. It just kind of comes through like my speech right now. It's spontaneous, and that's what happens with the books. And again, I think that's from meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. One meditator um, guru years ago said to me, and I don't know if he was playing with me because because they can they can play with you. He said to me, Selena, if you meditate, you'll look younger. <laughs> and I uh. actually think that there's truth to that. I think because. Uh -huh because you are connecting with a deeper part of yourself and you're not that the stress is not going to be showing on your face like well you know there's research now that correlates meditation practices with changes in the telomeres which is the part of the um cells and the chromosomes that reflect our aging Really? So there's really, yes, so there's really concrete evidence of that now. I had the, um, the psychiatrist at UCLA who did that research present at the last age conference at Pacifica. And, um, and there's other, you know, there's lots of other research about meditation and longevity. Um, but let's get, let's stay with the psychology of it. Okay. Because I think that's what our audience really wants. Okay. Like. All right. So I have another question for you. Um, in our society, the culture of which that we live in right now, um, there's a lot of ageism. And how do we maneuver through the ageism? 
And does the way that you think about aging affect the way that you age? Okay. So, um, you know, the UN has now recognized institutionalized ageism as a serious issue because most of the globe is, is going to be older adults. The birth rate is low and longevity is high. So the aging population of the earth is now getting older and older. And it's particularly serious in some Asian countries now, but even in the U.S. it's the case. And yet our social justice issues, our institutions, haven't really adapted to the reality. And I think some of us were really confronted with that during COVID when we saw a lot of negative remarks about the people in nursing homes. And there were a lot of sort of cold, contemptuous comments about people. So, you know, institutionalized ageism is in the business world, in corporations, in tech. I mean, you can't get a tech job if you're over 25. You know, in um, fashion, which is just starting to change a little bit, we now see some models in their 70s, maybe even in their 80s. Um, in politics that we see many older people who are um, kind of models of being really active in their 80s, some of them competent and some of them not competent, right? And I think there's a really important distinction there about ageism and the whole discussion that's happening around Joe Biden running for president again is that it's about competence, not age. Right. So for me, my world is more focused on the inner world. And what I discovered in doing my own shadow work is that there's a part of me that I call the inner ageist. And the inner ageist has bought into the social, political ageism of the culture and internalized it. As young kids, we internalize it if our families make ageist comments or mistreat grandparents, or we watch something on TV where there's an older actor who's being, you know, treated unkindly or with contempt. And so we learn at a very young age that young is good and old is bad. Strong is good and weak is bad. Independent is good and dependent is bad. And we internalize that message and it becomes this shadow, what I call a shadow figure, the inner ageist. And when I discovered this in myself, I found that there was research at Yale University by a psychologist named Becca Levy, who has spent her whole career studying the impact of internalized ageism. And what she found is that it has impact on brain health and memory, on cardiac health, on emotional health and self-image, even on longevity. Every kind of aspect of, bra of brain, mind, body functioning is influenced, is shaped by how we view aging as we age. And so it actually may be more important to uncover the inner ageist and really heal and, and work with that part of ourselves than to um, focus on some of the external social justice factors. I mean, some people are oriented more extroverted and politically active, and that's their kit, that you know, that's their thing, and that's really important. For me, it's just as important to do our inner work around ageism. So that's a big chapter in the book. I gave it a lot of space about how to do that. Yes, you did, <laughs> and it was it was really good. Um, uh, so we have all this ageism. How can we mitigate it? How can we mitigate it socially, culturally? I mean, I, I do it internally. I mean, is there is there some frames that we can shift? Um, I mean, a lot of people say, even those that I work with, that I work with, you know, 30% of my practice is the elderly. 
and and they say, you know, oh, I feel like I'm 35. And I'm like, I feel like I'm 35. Like everybody feels like we're 35. I don't know where that number comes from, but they all feel 35. And so if there's there's two things here. Is that a good thing to feel that, to feel that vibrant, useful energy, or is that part of denial? Okay. So um I wouldn't use the term elderly because I think that's a loaded term that brings up associations for people with frail and weak and needy and so on. So my so part of what I believe we need to do is reframe the language. And so I wanted to reframe it from senior to elder. And so anyone who turns 65 and gets a Medicare card becomes a senior. But you only become an elder when you do the inner work of age, when you become aware of your inner ageist and the impact it's having on you, and you walk through some of the other practices in the book to age consciously, then you go through that rite of passage and you become an elder. And indigenous cultures have this built in. We all know that Native American cultures have rites of passage to become an elder. But our mainstream Western post industrial culture doesn't have that, mostly because of ageism, because nobody wants to be old. So, in terms of the question of why do people feel like they're in midlife, I think that it can be very positive. I have a lot of energy and, you know, I'm productive and I'm getting things done. But the other side of that is I'm not doing all my doing in the same way that I was at 35. And so if we feel 35 and we continue to behave that way, meaning acting out of ego with the ego's agenda, acting heroically, like we're trying to control everything that's happening, um, still focused on material um, acquisitions, um, still focused on um, sort of neurotic drives that we were experiencing at midlife. And the way that Jung put this was really a beautiful quote. He said, the afternoon of life has a different purpose than the morning. But if we continue to behave like we're in the morning of life, there's damage to the soul. So we need to become aware of that 35-year-old inside of us and honor him or her in terms of our whatever that is, our productivity, our self-care, our families, our creativity. And at the same time, we need to honor the age of our bodies and include that in our decision-making and include that in our self-care. And so if we notice that we're in denial, so for example, um, I have a friend who said to me recently, well, I'm 67, I, I don't need to read this because you know I have so much longer, I have so many years, I'm not old. Now, we could say in this day and age that 67 isn't old, but we could also say she's in denial because she's not looking ahead at her 70s, which are right around the corner, and what that might mean for her. Now, she can't predict it, it's, it's uncertain, but she's not preparing herself for changes that will be inevitable. And in terms of the changes in the frame that you asked about, you know, we used to have this framework that aging after 50 meant nothing but decline. Everybody would go downhill and then die. So my friend at 67, we don't want to put her into the decline frame because actually most of what's happening now is people are aging and having this long horizontal period and actually dying more suddenly rather than long, slow declines, which was what everybody was dreading in that narrative, in the decline narrative. 
So there's this new narrative now about longevity that is bringing a lot of people into the volunteering world, into service, into spiritual practice, into all kinds of creativity. And so some of it is self-reflection, self-observation. What is right for you at this time? You may feel 35 and your body may be 67 or 75. What is right for you now? In particular, not anybody else. And how can you accept who you are now? Because if you want to be a different age, and you know, I used to have clients who just hated their bodies and the changes their bodies were going through, and it made them feel so badly about themselves, right? And that's the ageist messaging that we, you and I had growing up. It's less so now, but, you know, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely so still there. acceptance yeah. yeah. So that self-acceptance is key. Okay. So when self-acceptance, but is there a... We have a midlife crisis. As we go through the lifespan, we have a midlife crisis. We see that happen all the time. Is there a different crisis that happens for your word? And I want to thank you for for bringing that to my consciousness, the elder, for the elder crisis. Is there a crisis that happens when you become an elder? I'm wondering. Yes. Okay. So I call it the late life identity crisis. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Something triggers another identity crisis like we have in midlife. And for many people, it's retirement. But it could also be an illness or an emotional loss. And we end up saying to ourselves, who am I? Again, who am I now at 60? at 70, at 80, who am I without my spouse? Or who am I without my job, my role, my contribution? My husband is going through that now. He's been a fabulous psychologist for de many decades, and he's moving into semi-retirement. And I can see him... Um, really kind of questioning letting go of this role and shifting into what's next. And that's why I picked up this term, shifting from role to soul. I borrowed that phrase from Ram Dass. He coined that phrase. Because it says perfectly this what this identity crisis is about. We've lived in these roles, mother, wife, therapist, doctor, teacher, secretary, attorney. We lived in these roles, sister, um, daughter. And when these roles fall away in later life, who am I? Healthy person is another one. So who am I now? And that is really a call for spiritual practice because that's the identity that lasts, that's not fleeting that's not just based in the moment and on what we do. And so if we can begin to shift our unconscious identification from what we do to who we really are, to who we really are, whether we call it our Christ nature, our Buddha nature, spirit, being, um, soul, whatever it is we call it, that's okay. We can use the language of our own tradition, or we can make up our own language. But the, the late-life identity crisis is calling us to make that shift. Wow, that's really, really, really beautiful. So the late-life late identity crisis, I like how you put that because it is there's no ageism in it. And, and so that's really brilliant, Connie really, really brilliant. I, I really want to acknowledge that. That is amazing. Um, so th we have the identity crisis, the movement from role to soul, which you've 
eloquently expressed, the rite of passage. Uh, but are there any aspects of denial that we struggle with during that that time frame? I think most people struggle with denial of age, as we were saying a minute ago. And it may come up in all kinds of ways. Um, so, for example, people don't want to retire. Um, and there's a, a real struggle, especially for men. But now, you know, many women are so identified with their careers. It's, um, it's a struggle to let go of what we've done, what we do. And that's a shadow character I call the doer. So the doer is not good or bad, but it's an identity that may block the transition to the elder. Because if we remain attached to old roles and productivity and success, like we were identified with at midlife, then what happens? We deny the value of slowing down and pausing for self-reflection and taking the time to really ask, who am I now? And what practices do I need? Or what rituals do I need? Or who do I need as a companion at this time? What should I read about now? Um, how should I be creative now in a way that's completely different than I was creative before? I've just taken up knitting, and I'm having such a good time. Really? Yeah, that's so unexpected. My husband can't believe it. So, you know, and I feel like I'm channeling my grandma. So, you know, if we don't allow the doer to move off of center stage, then we're in denial of our own needs at this time. But let me clarify, because most people hear this and they go into a split, being and doing, right? or doing and not doing. Like, I'm not telling people to be couch potatoes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is a time for self-reflection. And that may lead you to be productive in a whole new way. It may lead you to a kind of service or volunteer work that you never imagined before, or a creative project, or whatever it is. So, for me, but the, but the deeper level, Selena, is on the level of awareness, what we're doing or don't or not doing isn't as important as what is the quality of awareness we're doing it with. We could talk about an elder's quality of awareness. So from the outside, I look like a workaholic. I mean, I, here I am, we're talking about the aging book, and I've got a new book coming out. So I look like a big doer. Yes. But internally, I'm not experiencing it that way. In my 40s, when I wrote a book about the shadow, I was really driven and focused on success and fame and money and all that crap. Today, I'm having this experience of freedom inside from the outcomes, freedom from the outcomes that I can't control. I really see I can't control how this book sells or how it affects people or how they read it or how they review it. I just had a bad review. There's nothing I can do about it. There's a way in which the elder's quality of awareness um, is so much less stressful and so much less egotistical, and much more about generosity and contribution and legacy. So for, for me, I'm focused on these books as my legacy. It's what I'm leaving behind. I didn't have children. They're my babies, and I'm leaving them behind. And it's a very different feeling from um, my experience of publishing in my 40s. So it's a, it's a totally a quality. The reason that you did it in your 40s and the reason you're doing it now are completely different. 
and your relationship to yourself is completely different because you have the wisdom of of age and and the work you know your depth psychological work that you did as a clinician and as a lecturer yes. and all of that has shifted you also and it has changed your relationship to the doer so that the old yes. doer when you were 40 and the the doer in your age at this at this moment is a completely different relationship and as you said at that time it things may not have come through at the same way that they are coming through now because you you've set the stage through your meditation and spiritual practice and so it's easy for you now because it's just the way it is and and it's you're following your soul path before you were doing your soul path not being your soul path is that am i getting it right yes that's exactly right i really am aware that um my so what i call my soul's mission i wrote about this in the book i discovered this through doing my life review that my soul's mission from all four different, very different careers was transmitting information about consciousness. Wow. And that that's why I've been doing everything I've been doing and I'm not doing it. It's coming through. It always has been coming through, but there were just more sort of blocks in the stream before where I thought I could manage it and control it and, you know, was more, um, there was more of an agenda about it. But at this stage of life, it's very clear that um, Connie's not in charge. And, um, and you also begin to see that with illnesses. I mean, my husband just had a health scare and he's very spiritually advanced. And we both just had to recognize we're, we're, we're not in control here. There's a lot of uncertainty living at this age. And, you know, I talked about um, the three qualities of awareness to become an elder. Pure awareness, which we're talking about in meditation. So connecting to the self or the transpersonal center or spirit on a regular basis. Shadow awareness, connecting to the psyche, the unconscious through dreams or um, creativity or shadow work, and mortality awareness. And maintaining this awareness that we really could die at any moment leaves us with this quality of aliveness and vitality and preciousness of the moment. And that's what Neil and I have just been living that so intensely as we've been going through these, these um, health crises. We have now, and it just pushes us into now and adoring each other and being really present and letting go because we, we do what we can do. I'm not saying we're passive, we do everything we can do, and we recognize this is the time we have. And so that is a part of being an elder. There isn't a sense of, you know, like my grandkids think they have forever. I mean, they don't. there's no reason for them to think that way. And then my stepkids in their 40s think they have forever. But for us, mortality awareness is a daily teaching. And um, it's really precious and really, really powerful. No, I, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, I had a, I want to share something with you. About eight or nine years ago, I had a dream. And the dream told me the date of my death. I freaked out for like three days I was not functional because it was much younger than I would have imagined. But it was the soul waking me up. What that dream did, I changed my life. I'm doing what I want. 
I am not worried about the future in, as all, the way a lot of people are worried. I'm just living my life. Whether I live or I don't live, it doesn't really matter. But the wake-up call that I got from that dream was phenomenal. And I want to go back to the Buddhists. They also meditate on their on your death. That way you focus on the present. Am I correct on that? Yes, they're actually in almost every tradition in um, in Christianity. It's called memento mori. Um, Buddhists meditate on skulls. I mean, there are all kinds of, tr of practices for meditating on the transitoriness of the body, and it's very powerful. And it's also a recognition that everything is temporary, yeah. and we're just moving through. And the part of us that lives on, whatever whatever we call that, is a part of us that's evolving and that will continue. But this body will die. My cunningness will die. And that has been um, with me in meditation for a long time now. Sometimes in my practice, I will do breathing in and breathing out. And with every exhale... I imagine that it's my last breath. And I just release it as deeply as I can, letting go and practicing dying. And there are other meditations like that as well to be able to um, practice the inevitable moment. But it's not inevitable that you'll be conscious at your death. That takes practices. So that is kind of built into all the traditions. Um, there are a lot of books and teachings about that and um, videos about that now. It's pretty openly available. Um, and, you know, I want to mention in the inner work of age, there are a lot of interviews with spiritual teachers. Um, and many of them talk about the practices that they're doing now in late life. Ken Wilbur, Father Thomas Keating, Krishna Das, Rabbi Ram Rabbi Rama Shapiro, and they're talking about practices that are um, that are appropriate or fit for this time of life, and so people can find those um, in those chapters. Wow! No, uh, uh, absolutely, and uh, I, I think you know, um, as you were talking about. Uh, meditating on your last breath. It, I, I just thought I'd never heard that. Uh, and I think that is extraordinary. And I'm going to incorporate that into my practice for personally and with my clients, because that's important. It brings them back into the present, uh, which is what we can get lost in, in, in the culture that we live in and the, you know, all, all the things that are going on. Uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, I want to go to a question that I have. You wrote about 80% of women are more likely to face poverty. I was shocked at this. I was devastated when when I heard you, uh, when I read this in your book. Uh, how can we make a change in this? This is not okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the social safety net for elders, but also for all poor people, is getting more and more frayed in our culture. And people feel very unsafe. Um, there's actually a high suicide rate now among white elder males. Um, there's high drug addiction to pain pills and alcohol. Um, and so, you know, many people are not having an easy time of it. And um, I think it's that's why it's important to maintain our connection to the political process and to voting people who speak about this, like Bernie Sanders and others, 
who speak up about um, how we protect the social safety net for the most vulnerable. Um, so I'm not an advocate of inner work alone or outer work alone. I really believe we need to do both in all these arenas that we're talking about. Um, and there's an international movement now against ageism. If people are interested in that, they can see what the UN is doing about it. Ashton Applewhite is big, um, has a wonderful website. She's a big ageism crusader and anti-ageism crusader. There's a lot going on in that social justice field. And, and there's really a need, and there's a lot of blogs online too. Um, changing Aging, Saging International, S-A-G-E hyphen I-N-G, is a community of elders who are teaching, um, oh, they have all kinds of webinars happening, and they have a one-year program that's an initiation to become an elder, which I took before I wrote my book, and that's available to everyone, saging.org. Um, there's also Third Act, which is a fabulous community of elders who are interested in the climate crisis and the democracy crisis, being headed by Bill McKibben, who was the founder of 350.org. So that's a great way to engage. Um, they're focused on moving money out of the fossil fuel banks. And so while there's all this poverty in the older adult population, we also, baby boomers, also have the more resources than any other group. And so those of us with resources can get engaged by moving our money into banks that are not funding the climate crisis. Um, my husband and I are just, we just found green credit cards and we're cutting up our old cards. So there's all kinds of ways to engage in um, in the politics of all this as well. Green credit cards. That's the first. I've never heard of that. That's that's something new. I'm going to look into green credit cards. Yes. Yeah. So greenamerica.org. Let me put it in the chat because I'm so passionate about this. Oh, I lost. Let me see. Here's the chat. There it was out. Greenamerica.org gives you, I think it's .org. Maybe it's .com. I'm not sure if it's com or org. Okay. Um, so they'll give you a selection of credit cards that are um, that have nothing to do with the bad banks, the five big bad banks, and that fund all positive social projects. Wow. So there's all you know. There's a lot of different ways that elders and people of every age now can contribute and become engaged and find purpose. If you're interested in um, intergenerational work, Encore.org, which used to be for elders, has now become co-generation. And so it's youth and elders working together in all different kinds of causes. And that's another great group. Wonderful. I was unaware of all of this. Thank you for enlightening me. <laughs> enlightening me, my goodness. Um, I want to go to... Uh, you know, you are the guru on shadow work. You have written the books on that. Are there shadow characters that emerge as you are aging that you want to bring out to us um, and and uh, talk about? Okay, so let's define the shadow so people are not lost here. So the shadow is the name that Carl Jung gave to the personal unconscious. That part of us that holds the forbidden, unwelcome, unacceptable feelings, traits, behaviors in us that we learn as very young children that's not okay. It's not okay to cry. It's not okay to get angry. It's not okay to say that. It's not okay to hit your brother, whatever it is. And those parts of us get repressed, we say in psychology, or banished to the unconscious. And then what happens is that builds energy. It's energy. It's charge. And it begins to erupt in other stages of our life. You can see teenagers acting out their shadows in all kinds of ways. 
You could see politicians these days, every politician acting out their shadows, right? So um, you can see it in addiction. You can see it in depression. You can see it in um, creativity blocks. You can see it in self-sabotaging choices, like choosing the same romantic partner over and over and over again, right? So... Um, Yes, we know a lot. I know a lot of people that are doing that. My goodness. Yes. Why? Yeah. Stop and they don't. They just don't stop no matter what I say. Yeah. So that's that's what romancing the shadow is about because our unconscious is leading us to do that. And it has certain valid needs in there to keep on acting it out and become conscious of why of what the patterns are. Right. But it's so painful. Yes. It's painful to experience and it's painful to watch. Um, so as we age, we continue to meet the shadow. We continue to encounter these unwelcome parts of ourselves. So you and I talked about the inner ageist and we talked about the doer. So my work has been taking this kind of amorphous, generalized mush of the shadow inside the body-mind and making conscious these little parts that I call shadow characters by identifying what are we saying to ourselves, what are we feeling, and what are we, what are we sensing in the body. And when we get those three cues, we can then get an image and a name for a shadow character like the inner ageist. And when we have that figure it's no longer lost in that amorphous general shadow content. It becomes specific and we start to see it's the same thing every single time. Every time that addict shows up, the foodie or the um, couch potato or the lazy one or the angry guy, whatever it is, it always says the same thing in your mind, feels the same thing, and has the same bodily sensations every single time. So you start to recognize this as a recurring character in your psyche. And with age, and especially the longevity that we experience now, we, we begin to experience these shadow characters bumping up into awareness in all kinds of ways. So it may come up as the self-hate we were talking about. It may come up as um, um, the denial we were talking about. So the denier is, you know, holding on to youth or midlife with a death grip. And, and so we can begin then after we can begin to see, I, I interviewed a bunch of people who had a lot of surgery to keep from getting old, and I didn't put this in the book, but there's a way in which people who are doing that can accept the changes in their bodies, and for some people, that's a shadow character. I, I didn't use it because I don't think it's true. It's so, it's so nuanced. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can look at celebrities who do that and understand that the ageism in their industry requires that of them. Or we can say, well, no, there are all these older women in the industry who don't do that, and they still, you know, get jobs. So it's a very complex thing. So you go into the individual psychology and you begin to see, is that woman or man in denial or in self-rejection or self-loathing or in financial fear if they don't do that or and so what is underneath and then you can kind of uncover who the shadow character is and what is that part that's leading them to this behavior and i think for every person you know it's a little bit different there are communities that welcome and honor elders. There are families 
that, you know, revere grandparents and those folks have different experiences of their shadows. Um, and then there's, I think, the larger general population that's really struggling with this. Um, you know, I, one of another one of the figures that came up for the book is the bag lady. And you mentioned the poverty, epidemic poverty among older women. And many people I interviewed had that fear of becoming homeless and poor and dependent and alone on the street, you know, in their 80s. And so it turned out, I did some research, and there was actually an insurance company that found that there's an epidemic of this bad lady shadow character in American women. Yeah, and you know what? It doesn't only start when you're elder. I have young women in their 20s coming in and have, have such a fear of, of pushing the shopping cart on the street. And it, so it doesn't, I think it's, for women, I don't. I don't hear men talking like this, but I hear women right across the generations talking about this. That's yeah. How did we get here? It's, I mean, how did it's it through the lifespan? It's through the lifespan because we internalize it when we're young. Internalized ageism happens in childhood, and I now they know are, that. Oh, it yeah. happens in childhood. It happens so in childhood. We're set up in childhood the way we think about age. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have a single positive model of an elder in my childhood. I don't know if you know. I, 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 I didn't I, know. Actually, I, I believe I, you know, I, because I had more of a pathological family, uh, I think my, my psychological health to both my grandmothers who were angels. And so okay. they saved me. They they saved me. And I Okay, I'm right. Grateful. But not but not only in that way, Selena, also because you internalize them as positive elders. Yes. And many people don't have that. And if you have that, it gives you some inoculation against the ageism. I interviewed one woman who said she couldn't wait till she was really old. She was so excited about it because she had, you know, all these great women in her life. So that makes a difference. But the shadow forms right along with the ego. So if we're learning as our personalities are shaped that young is good and old is bad. I mean, I asked my grandkids about this. Getting old is terrible to them. They can't see anything good about it, you know. Yeah, they can't see anything good about it. And then I show them my books and I talk to them about it. And I, you know, but we learn this when we're very young. I remember watching uh, All in the Family and Archie Bunker when I was growing up. You may be oh, too. Yeah. No, I, I've watched Ar Archie Bunker too, yes. Yeah. But he is the most ageist, sexist character. And I watched that through my whole childhood. So these messages come early. And they carry with us through the lifespan. And so, you know, these these shadow characters form along with those messages and they're outside of our awareness. And we're not we don't become conscious of them until they erupt in these uncomfortable ways. Right. Now there's we have a couple of women that I want to talk about. Nancy Pelosi, who is working through her eighties. Uh, Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, and there's many more. I mean, we're talking political. There's more than this, but let's just stick to these. They are, in a certain way, trailblazers because in you know, 30, 40 years ago, there weren't these kinds of women doing that. Have they changed the archetype or the myth of aging for us? Well, I think for people who are observant and sensitive to what's happening, they can see the competence and creativity and brilliance of those three women. Um, I think Jane Fonda is coming out with it, like her fourth movie now. I mean, she's so prolific right now. Um, you know, but then there's also Diane Feinstein, 
who won't step down, although she's lost her confidence. So there's a tension between how long do we work? How long do we hold on to power? How long do we stay in the public arena or the, or the corporate arena? And what happens when we start to deny our limitations? So you asked me about denial, and I think denial of limitations is really a big one. Yes. So yes, there's this modeling that's really positive now. Um, and certainly those three women are incredible, so is Gloria Steinem. I mean, I could name a whole bunch of them. Of course. And then there are people who are um, who are in denial that they've reached a limit. Right. And that's what, you know, people are now saying about Biden. He looks very competent. I don't know the story, you know. But there is this, it's very tricky because the language doesn't have the nuance to really talk about age in these ways. Because as you said, we haven't had these kind of models before. We haven't had a president who at 80 is so compromised. And so um, it's very tricky, and I, I don't know how much it's seeping into the collective yet. I really don't know that. What is a completed life? So very individual, right? What's a fulfilled, completed life for me may not be the same for you. So the chapter on life completion seemed really important to me as a way to communicate um, that we need a vision for this time. And each of us needs our own vision for fulfillment. So I use the story of Moses not getting into the promised land. And I asked, what is your promised land? And what happens if you enter it or if you're not allowed to enter it? And I got, you know, different responses from different people, sort of different levels of response to the question. And for me, it's very much a spiritual question because my vision has been about uh, attaining a higher level of consciousness, and that's been the meaning of my life. For other people, it's about seeing their grandkids grow up or leaving some kind of creative legacy or um, working in service and volunteering and it having an impact on younger people's lives. So I think those kinds of questions um, can bring a lot of meaning at this time. And the question of um, what would you regret not having done on your deathbed? Wow, that's pretty powerful. It's a, a part of that Very question. Powerful. Very powerful. It's a and if we sit with that, we can get a sense, I think, of what is a completed life for us. What do we really, like my friend Phil has been telling me for five decades that he has to write a novel. And he's in his 70s and he's doing it. And he's never been happier. Wow. So what is that for you? You know, what is that? that one thing that you'll regret if you don't say it or do it. For some people, it may be an apology, giving or receiving forgiveness. Wow. For some people, it may be um, a feeling, an experience of a feeling that they've never allowed. Or reimagining a belief like i had a client who said he was a buddhist and he was practicing buddhist meditation but when we 
really uncovered his images of God in the in shadow work. He had this Catholic Pope figure telling him he was bad, shaking his finger at him, telling him he was bad for his sexual feelings. And that was underneath all these Buddhist practices that were calming him down, and he couldn't figure out why he was so anxious. So in order to be able to, you know, have life, experience life completion, we need to dig and kind of excavate and explore our psyches in a way that um, allows us to find that completion, that peace, that peace of mind, and that self-acceptance that we were talking about, and the contribution or the legacy that's just for us. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I'm very aware now, as I said, I didn't have kids, but I have grandkids through my husband. And I'm very aware when I'm with them of the impact that I'm having on the future. And one of the little boys is very anxious, and I sit with him and I breathe, and he calms down. And I don't tell him what I'm doing, but I can feel him calm down. And the other kids, I t there we read together. So whatever it is, your contribution can be meaningful to the future. And you the future have made an incredible contribution through your wisdom, through your books, through your lectures, through your teaching. I am totally honored. From the Thank bottom you. of my heart, I am honored to have you here to talk about this topic of aging. I mean, um, really amazing, amazing work that you've done. Creative, amazing, uh, brilliant. I, I have there's so many words. Thank you for being on this show. Really. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you to love you too.